In 1991, when the political conflict between Chechen and insurgents in the Russian army began, Kasan Bayev, and I hope that's close enough to correct pronunciation, was a wealthy Chechen surgeon, but when Russia began to bomb his homeland, he gave up safety and, and security and opened a small hospital in his hometown of Alkankala. At times, the one-story cement uh, building was staffed by just six nurses and a handful of volunteers, and Dr. Kayev was the only physician. Over the next six years, Bayev treated thousands of people under the most brutal conditions, using outdated instruments and dwindling medical supplies, and with the constant threat of missiles overhead. He once performed 67 amputations in 48 hours. A witness to the unspeakable horrors of war, Bayev treated anyone, Chechen or Russian, soldier or civilian, and eventually became a marked man hated by both sides in one of the world's ugliest and least understood conflicts. Under threat from both sides, Bayev finally fled Chechnya early in 2000 and took refuge in the United States. Throughout his ordeal, he has maintained his commitment to medicine and medical ethics and has been honored by Human Rights Watch, Physicians for Human Rights, and Amnesty International. We're fortunate to have him living across the river in Cambridge, close enough to come and speak to us tonight about his book, The Oath, A Surgeon Under Fire, which he wrote in very close collaboration with Ruth Daniloff, whose articles on the war in Chechnya have appeared in a wide variety of journals, and Nicholas Daniloff, former Moscow bureau chief for U.S. News and World Report. Please welcome Dr. Kassan Bayet. It is, a, it is an honor for me to be speaking at the Boston Athenaeum. Being in an ancient place like this always lifts my spirits. Boston has no revolution and bloodshed, yet the city has survived to build magnificent universities, parks, and libraries like this one. Across from this building is an old granary burying ground where people who gave their lives for library lie. Liberty lie. If Boston can do it, Maybe Chechnya can too. I hope that one day my war torn nation can rebuild itself and find peace and freedom. Please forgive my English during the war. Suffered three concussions and I was in a coma for a week. Before the war, I, <clears throat> I had a good memory. Sometimes during the bombing, when I was operating, I used to recite poetry. <clears throat> now I can't remember those poems. English words often escape me. I suffer from what you call Senior moments. <laughs> I write the oath because I wanted the world to know war is hell. There are no winners in war. I also wanted to describe the Chechen people who have been so unfairly called international terrorists in the post 9 11 world. I arrived in the United States in April. I was invited by physician for human rights. 
I met Nick Danilo and his wife Ruth in Boston. They speak Russian and are familiar with my part of the world. Both Nick and Ruth are here with me today. I believe fate brought us together to produce this book. Most people can't find Chechnya on the map. They know almost nothing about our history, which goes back thousands of years. They know nothing of our traditions, our struggle to be free, our, or our spirit, born high in the mountains of the Caucasus. We are a very private people. We don't talk much about ourselves. Outsiders have difficulty understanding us. I write about my family and friends. I talk <coughs> about individuals who have brought honor to our nations as well as those who have brought shame. I want you to see us as human beings with a capacity for love, anger, sorrow. Much of the book is based on the diaries I kept during the war. I would write whenever the bombing stopped or when I found shelter in a cellar, or often in the dark. I write in code so that the Russian could not read my notice of the found them. When possible, my nephew videotaped the conditions in my hospital and interviewed my patients. I wanted <coughs> a record of the suffering of my people. In my book, I also write about my childhood of my <coughs> student years when I studied to be a surgeon in Russia and of the athletic competitions I won. I know how lucky I am to be in America. The U.S. government has been so generous with me and my family. However, not a day goes by that I don't think of Chechnya. And wish I was back there helping my people. I feel guilty that I am here and that they are there. I very much hope I can help the children through the International Committee for the Children of Chechnya, which is a non-profit organization I now head up. You will see the foundation flyer in your this. Uh, Nick uh, comments on slide slideshow is good evening. Uh, do we need to turn the lights down a little bit, or is this visible? Uh, it's visible. Ah, okay, very good. 
Well, let me comment a little bit on these uh, pictures. Uh, this, of course, is the cover of Hassan's book. And you can see the picture of him uh, drinking a cup of tea. This was taken during that terrible day in February of uh, 2000 when 300 wounded soldiers and other people, evacuees from Grozny, were brought to his hospital. He operated then for 48 hours without stop. And he did, as you've already heard, 67 uh, amputations and seven brain surgeries um, and also removed shrapnel and treated other wounds. Uh, by the way, uh, I think Hassan was a little too modest and didn't tell you uh, what he might have about the operations. Uh, he was running out of supplies. Uh, and he had to do all of the operations with a carpenter's hacksaw. He had only a carpenter's drill in order to do the brain surgeries, to drill through the skull, uh, to remove, uh, to relieve the pressure on the brain. And he also has told us, and you'll find it in the book, that he had very little anesthetic. He had no general anesthetics, but had to use the dental anesthetic lidocaine, which is a 1% uh, solution which your dentist uses when he fills your teeth, he used 1% lidocaine in the amputations that he was doing. At the bottom of the cover, uh, what you see are the Chechen fighters dragging their wounded to his hospital. Uh, they evacuated from uh, Grozny on the night of January 31, to February 1, 2000. Uh, and in the course of that evacuation, they went through a minefield. They knew that there were mines, but they got lost because there was a snow covering on the minefields. And many people stepped on mines and were brought in with very damaged feet. I uh, wanted to give you some sort of sense of what the Caucasus look like. Uh, these, this is the great Caucasian mountain range, which divides Russia from the Middle East. And it's also a boundary line between Islam and Christianity. Uh, this is a photograph that Ruth took when we were visiting that area in the late 1990s. And it's very beautiful. And Hassan tells us that uh, his friends, his family, often referred to it as Little Switzerland. Uh, here is a picture of how mountains are built right in, or excuse me, not mountains. <laughs> I suppose I should have said mountains are built into houses, but houses are built into mountains. Uh, these are made out of uh, uh, cubic blocks of, of stone, often uh, three stories high with animals at the bottom story, hay in the middle story, and the family living on top. I wanted to give you a sense of uh, where Chechnya is now that we've had the introduction to it. Uh, in the upper left-hand corner, you can see a little map of European Russia, and that little red square is Chechnya. And as you look at the bigger picture, you see that Chechnya is surrounded on all sides by the Russian Federation. It is, in fact, from the Russian point of view, a part of the Russian Federation. And to the south, uh, there is the newly independent Republic of Georgia. Uh, the Chechens have a long history of seeking home rule and independence. They like to trace it back uh, 400 years to Ivan the Terrible. Uh, but in more recent memory, and I'm thinking now about the 19th century, Imam Shamil, who was the famous uh, religious warrior, fought the Russians for 30 years until he was finally defeated uh, around, when was it, 1855? Yes. 18, in 1855, uh, the Russians finally defeated him. But that desire for uh, independence has continued. And during the Second World War, Stalin was concerned that they might collaborate with the Nazis who were invading in that part of the world. So what he did was not similar to what the United States did with the Japanese population in the United States. What Stalin did was he loaded the whole population of Chechnya, one million people, 
into cattle cars without food or water and transported them for six weeks to Kazakhstan or Siberia. And on the way, about 300,000 of the Chechens died. Uh, I should add, of course, that under Khrushchev in 1956, they were allowed to return to Chechnya, where they found that the houses that they had built had already been occupied by people of other na nationalities. Grozny, which is the capital of Chechnya, uh, used to be one of the most beautiful cities of the northern Caucasus. Uh, but when the first war broke out, that was in 1994, uh, the Russians started seriously bombing not just Grozny, where the population incidentally was 50% Russian. Uh, they started bombing all over uh, Chechnya. This is a picture taken during the first war. And of course, what it says is that even in the ruins, life has to go on and does go on. Hassan tells me that uh, this picture already is out of date because during the second war, from 1999, and essentially is continuing, uh, these buildings have all been leveled, and that you can see from one end of the city to the other. Hassan uh, operated, as I said, with limited supplies. And in this particular picture, uh, he is removing the eye of a teenager who uh, receives shrapnel uh, in the face. Some of the uh, interesting and imaginative ways of dealing with the crises uh, are written in that caption that you see there. He used egg yolks to treat burns, and when he ran out of sterile solutions, he urged his patients to use their own urine to clean their wounds because urine is sterile. And as I said earlier, he used a carpenter's hacksaw to do the operations, and because he ran out of suture thread, he used ordinary household thread soaked in alcohol uh, to sew up the wounds. This is a picture of Hassan and one of his assistants laying an old Russian woman uh, on the operating table. Her name is Kuznetsova. And she took uh, a shrapnel hit to her left shoulder. She was found lying on the floor of her apartment by Russian soldiers. And they brought her naked, by the way, to the hospital on an armored personnel carrier and dumped her on the threshold of the hospital. Uh, Hassan took her and uh, cleaned up her wounds, sewed, sewed up her shoulder. And then with several other patients, he put her in a dugout bomb shelter that was created in the courtyard of the hospital. And during one of the cleaning up operations that the Russians conducted, uh, they came through and uh, threw a live grenade into that dugout, killing Kuznetsova and the other four or five patients who were harboring, taking shelter there. Hassan couldn't have done the work that he did without uh, a faithful group of nurses. And this is his uh, most favorite nurse, Rumani. And the picture here shows how she is sterilizing instruments uh, in a bath of flaming alcohol. Her husband wanted her to leave, but she said, my place is with Hassan, and so she stayed. And here you see Hassan about to operate, to, about to amputate the hand of a man who had recently come back to Chechnya from elsewhere in Russia. He pleaded with Hassan not to uh, cut his hand off because he wanted to build a house. But uh, Hassan tells us that there was no way of saving that hand. It was just flapping back and forth. And here uh, you see the picture of that uh, trusted carpenter's saw. Hassan tells uh, us a funny story, which actually he told us after the book was published. We were really quite annoyed at him for not telling it to us before. Uh, but uh, during one of his operations, the owner of this saw had taken the saw back to his house uh, to build a set of bookshelves. And uh, in the middle of the operation, they realized they didn't have the saw, and they had to run off to the man's house and retrieve it in order to continue and complete the operation. Uh, this 
picture shows uh, Hassan binding up uh, an amputee, and what's interesting here is the person in the middle, who is Ali. Ali is Hassan's nephew. Uh, he was a second-year medical student, and uh, he helped Hassan uh, do many of the difficult operations during the Second War. Hassan also had another nephew, Adam, the older brother of Ali, and it was Adam who took most of these photographs of operations. Adam also uh, took videotapes. He was working as a stringer for the Reuters news agency. And during uh, <coughs> the war, Reuters um, filmed and projected and distributed, showed uh, on television many of those films. The Russians learned of this, and one night they murdered Adam. Uh, he died in Ali's hands, in Ali's arms. Ali himself was uh, very seriously tortured by the Russians, held in a pit for 39 days, and uh, finally ransomed for the sum of $10,000. The worst day of my life. Uh, this is a picture of the notorious field commander, Shamil Basayev. Basayev was leading the evacuation out of Grozny on uh, the night of January 31 to February 1st. He stepped on a mine which nearly blew off his right foot. Now, the Russians had put a bounty on Basayev's head of a million dollars. Hassan paid no attention to that blandishment, but upheld the Hippocratic Oath, saved Basayev's life, amputated his leg, and sent him on his way. Basayev today continues the resistance against uh, the Russians. In this picture, Hassan is consulting with relatives of uh, the patient who's lying on the stretcher. And I think one of the things that is interesting about this photograph, if you look closely, you'll see blood on the floor. You'll see blood all over Hassan's greens. Uh, there's blood on the walls. Hassan tells us that the time that this picture was taken, which I think was February 1 or 2, 2000, there were so many wounded. There was something like 300. Was it 300 wounded, 300. wasn't it? 300 wounded. There was no place to put them. Uh, and they were stacked in the corridors. Uh, they were even lying on mattresses outside in the courtyard on the snow, waiting for their turn to be treated by Hassan. Hassan today uh, can't go back to Chechnya. He's wanted principally by the Russians because he saved Basayev's life. But Hassan continues to be half in Chechnya. He's very concerned about the children of Chechnya, and he can tell you some of the terrible statistics of the maimed children who've lost arms and legs, who need um, further follow-up operations. <laughs> And he wanted to end this uh, slideshow uh, with some attention to the children. This is a child, uh, you can see, in rather miserable situation in the uh, refugee camp in Ingushetia. And by the way, on October 1st, the Russians closed the refugee camps in Ingushetia, of which there were about, I think, a dozen, and forced all of these refugees back into Chechnya, where... There is still wartime conditions and very little security. Again, another innocent victim of uh, this terrible conflict. This is a young girl who has received burns to her face. Uh, here is a young boy who stepped on a mine. By the way, many of the mines that the Russians have dropped in Chechnya look like toys, and children pick them up, and their arms and legs are blown off. Uh, Hassan would like to make the point, and we've written it into this slide here, that uh, in the nine years that the wars have been going on, a quarter of Chechnya's population has been killed. Uh, in American terms, that would be something like 70 million people. It, this is an enormous figure, and uh, Hassan is concerned about the future of his people. Uh, finally, the last picture dealing with the fate of the children, um, as you can see, 
a quarter of the children suffer from birth defects when they're born. The infant mortality rate is very high. And there's something like 28,000 orphans roaming around uh, Grozny. Uh, the situation is catastrophic, but we learn nothing about it because the Russians have placed an information blockade around Chechnya. Uh, they don't let journalists in, certainly not Western journalists, not free Western journalists. They do let them in on guided tours. And it's only an occasional brave soul like Anne Niva, the French correspondent who disguises herself as a Chechen woman uh, and sneaks into Chechnya and gets a bit of information out. And Hassan has been in touch with Anne Niva and uh, his most recent information comes from her as well as from his family who remains in Al Khan Kala. Happier times in Vermont, and we might even say happier times at the Boston Athenaeum, because uh, all of these people in this uh, picture are here tonight, uh, with the exception of Ali, who is on Nantucket. Uh, but uh, here you see in the back uh, Hassan, and to his left, Chava, and to her left, Mariam. In the front, you see Adam, and uh, to the right, Islam, Marcha. Zara, his wife, and Satsita, who was born in Boston eight months ago. Uh, these are the folks that were left behind. To the left, Malika, one of Hassan's sisters, Nana, his mother, and there you can see Mariam, and then Marha, his father, Dada, Islam, and to the right, Zara. So that brings us to the end, and uh, with that, I guess we can turn this off and continue with questions and some answers. Let me and just the turn this off. Good, good idea. <laughs> yes. If I may uh, just interrupt that announcement for a moment, uh, I also wanted to read a little bit from the book. Yeah. And if you'll indulge me, uh, then after that we can uh, go to questions and answers. Let me just tell you a little bit about this passage in the book. Um, as I think you're all convinced now, war is a horrible thing, and particularly this war that seems to have no end and no negotiated future, at least in the near term. But funny things, strange things happen in these uh, incredibly chaotic times. And one of them, Hassan, uh, revealed to us had to do with an older woman whom he saw standing constantly in the corridors of his hospital. And she wanted very much to speak to him, but she was embarrassed. And now I read a little bit from page 269. Please, doctor, I need to talk to you in private. She blocked my path. I can see how busy you are with all the wounded, but I'm so embarrassed. She must have been wounded in her private parts, and I didn't know how to tell. She didn't know how to tell me, I thought. In our country, women don't talk with each other Women and men don't talk with each other about such things as childbirth and sex. Now I look more closely at the woman. Umajava, I asked. I realized that I had seen her often around town. She had quite a reputation for organizing protests and for talking back to the Russians, accusing them of breaking their promises. Her first name was Malika. But everyone called her by her family name, Umajava. She nodded. Come on, I'm a doctor, I said. Everybody here is having a terrible time. You can tell me your problem. A Russian bombardment was not the time for female modesty, I thought. I took her elbow and led her into the room that served as my office. And she sat on the edge of the chair, her hands fidgeting in her lap. There's a member of our family who's been wounded, 
Umajava said. She's like a daughter to me. She's our breadwinner. She paused. But I'm embarrassed to tell you. Bring her in, I said, rising to my feet. We'll treat her. There's no problem. I don't think you understand, Dr. Umajava went on. It's Zoika. Zoika, bring her in. My patience was running out. I can't, she said. You see, Zoika is my cow. She's really a member of the family. A piece of shrapnel has lodged in her neck where it meets the shoulder. So that was it, a cow. I don't operate on animals, I said. I simply don't have time. Her eyes filled with tears. It's really awkward for me to come here and to burden you with our problems, particularly since there's so many here on the edge of life and death. But please understand, doctor, Zoika is our life too. Without her, my five children will go hungry. I can't leave the hospital. More wounded will be coming in, I protested. But I felt myself weakening. I knew very well the importance of a cow in a Chechen family. I was always lecturing the townspeople about keeping their animals indoors during a bombardment. I think it was the mention of her children that broke me down. All right, all right, but I've really got to make it as quick as possible. A friend of Umarjava's drove me to her house on the outskirts of town. Nearly all the houses along the way were either damaged or in ruins. Zoika lay on her side in a makeshift barn on the far side of the courtyard where she had fallen when she was hit. She was a ginger animal with a splash of white down her forehead. Her coat was groomed to a silky softness, not a splatter of cow dung or mud on her. Two braids intertwined with red ribbons hung over her forehead as though she was awaiting a prospective suitor. I wonder if she was decked out especially for me, or if the ribbons were meant to ward off the evil eye. A copper bell hung from her neck. Just below the leather strap, holding the bell, I saw the wound. It was deep, penetrating almost to her spine. Umarjava squatted on her heels in the mud and began stroking the cow's head. There, there, she crooned. Doctor has come to help you. Soon you'll be better. We'll have to tie her feet so she won't thrash around. I knelt down, opened my bag, and began selecting the instruments. Umarjava patted Zoika. That's not necessary. Better that I stroke her and talk to her. She understands everything. She put her face close to the cow and rubbed her neck. You understand. Doctor is here to make you better. You be a good girl. The cow's large brown eyes stared up at me, imploring, full of trust. My heart went out to the cow. I'd seen that look before in the eyes of childhood friends who ended up on my operating table, so shattered, I couldn't do anything to save them. Right now, I was not taking any chances on Zoika being a good girl. So I anesthetized the area of the wound. Usually, I hunt for the shrapnel before anesthetizing. That way, you can tell by the reactions of the patients when you are getting closer. I widened the wound, which was about two inches by two inches, to make it easier to remove the shrapnel. Then I inserted my forceps, and in the opening, where I found a large piece of metal, out came its sharp edges, as sharp as a razor. I worked slowly. A cow's neck was unfamiliar territory. I didn't want to cut into any veins or arteries while I worked. Throughout the hour and a half procedure, Zoika remained calm. I was amazed. Afterward, I explained to Umarjava what to do in the days ahead and how important it was to change the dressings daily. A few weeks later, there was Umarjava by my operating room again. Zoika wants to thank you, she said, smiling. 
she handed me a big aluminum can of milk, a crock of sour cream, and a packet of cottage cheese. I'm glad she's recovering, I said. I'm glad she's recovering. Umajava beamed. Soika understands everything. I almost believed her. Может быть, ты скажешь про Умажеву? То, что я просто хотел добавить в двух словах. I'd just like to add two words. Во время зачистки она играла очень большую роль в этом селе. During the mopping up operations in our village, Umajava played a very important role. И, конечно, она очень сильно мешала федералам. And uh, she presented really quite an obstacle to the federal troops. И в один день ночью пришли, ее вывели на улицу и расстреляли. And one day, uh, Russian troops came to her house and shot her dead. И это, конечно, была для односельчан большая трагедия. And this for us villagers was a terrible tragedy. He said federal troops. Federal troops are Russian troops. Ее вывели, были свидетели, которые... Да, русские военные, да. Ей неоднократно угрожали. Russian federal troops came and executed her. They threatened her many times. Она не подписывала документы во время зачистки, когда, что как бы зачистка прошла без нарушения. She refused to sign papers saying that the mopping up operations had gone peacefully, Потому что without время... abuses. Зачистки забирали, избивали, она была свидетельницей. И она открыто выступала. And she openly spoke about this. Об этом писали и в российских газетах. And this was also written about in the Russian press. И было много свидетелей, когда на другой улице поставили uh, БТР, зашли и это видели односельчане. And there were many times when an armored personnel carrier would be stationed on the streets, and there were witnesses. И когда односельчане выступили, сказали, что видели, в принципе, сами федералы не отрицали. And even the federal, the federal Russian troops, did not deny this. А можно задать тебе политический вопрос? Ты понял? Yeah. Подожди. Uh, did everybody hear the question? Uh, the question was, uh, first of all, uh, our guest was saying how much she admired Hassan, that he was really above politics, uh, but that she had also seen uh, films that have recently been presented about Chechnya, uh, and she was noting that Boris Berezovsky, who is one of the Russian moguls who is now living abroad, uh, has suggested that possibly the bombing of Russian apartment buildings actually had been undertaken not by the Chechens, but by Russian security forces as a type of provocation. Ну, то, что касается этих зданий, по сегодняшний день нет ни одной доказательства, что это сделали чеченцы. 
Up until the present day, there is still no real evidence that the bombings of the apartment buildings was conducted by the Chechens. И когда были эти взрывы в Москве, ловили буквально образом на улице чеченцев и около трех тысяч чеченцев арестовали. And when these explosions took place in Moscow, uh, they went around arresting Chechens, and something like 3,000 Chechens were arrested. Но так и они доказать не смогли, потому что, конечно, были моменты, которые они подозревали. Of course, there were moments when they suspected that this might be the work of Chechens, but they weren't able to demonstrate it and prove it with evidence. И избивали, были пытки, но никто на себя это не взял. They tortured people, uh, they beat people, but none of these people acknowledged or admitted to doing it. И, в принципе, нет ни одного пойманного чеченца. Uh, no Chechen has really been caught for это this. Это темная история. This is a very dark story. Uh, in the back of the room, sir. Uh, is Russia trying to control Chechnya because of its oil? Понимаете, сегодня вообще слово терроризм это хорошее прикрытие. You know, today the word uh, terrorism is a very good cover. За этим кроется совсем другое. Many things are hidden under this cover. Я думаю, что, конечно, большую роль играет эта нефть. Yeah, I think that oil does play a big role. И Чечня в то же время играет в стратегическом плане большую роль. And uh, Chechnya also has a strategic role in all of this. In the back of the room? Как, как uh, чеченцы могут представлять перед uh, русской армией uh, верно, что они криминалы, что у них, у них есть свои связи, они могут импортировать оружие и так далее. Какая есть связь между чеченцы и ма мафиозами? <coughs> До Первой войны я жил в Москве, и много говорили о чеченской мафии. Uh, during the first, uh, before the first war, I lived in Moscow, and a lot was said about the Chechen mafia. И как лицо кавказской национальности мне часто приходилось сталкиваться, проверяли документы и даже забирали в отдел милиции. As a person uh, so-called of Caucasian nationality, that, by the way, is a common expression in Russia for people from the Caucasus. Uh, I was often uh, uh, stopped and taken to the police station. And as soon as I got into the police station, I was considered to be a mafiosi. 
это была специальная, да, там, я не отрицаю, может быть, какая-то группа была там, чеченская э, мафия, это тогда было модно, но когда говорили, что э, полностью контролирует Россию или там Москву чеченская мафия, это было, было преувеличено. I don't deny that there may be some Chechen criminals, some Chechen mafiosi, but to suggest that uh, the Chechen mafia controls all of Moscow, that's highly exaggerated. В Москве была очень большая мафия, это Солн... Солнцевская бригада, Подольская бригада, их можно было столько перечислить. Тогда это, видимо, сама политика по отношению к Чечне, она с каждым днем нагнеталась, и, конечно, это была преувеличенная такая пропаганда. The Russian policy hardened and hardened, but this was a really exaggerated propaganda. И поэтому, когда говорят, что экспортировали оружие, что это, это все придумано. And to say that uh, they exported weapons, that's all made up. Как говорится, бумага все выдерживает. Это новое выражение для меня. Бумага все выдерживает. Okay, very good. Did everybody hear that? And once again? Ah, the, yeah, the paper has no shame. Другими народами. Ну, конечно, кого... на Кавказе эту трагедию люди, конечно, сочувствуют. Well, of course, this is a tragedy, and people naturally uh, are sympathetic. Потому что на Кавказе между соседними республиками есть и родственные отношения, и Чеченки вышли там за ингушей, ингушки вышли за чеченцев, и это большая связь. Uh, in the various republics of uh, the Caucasus, there are a lot of interrelationships, a lot of intermarriages. A, a Chechen might marry a, an ingush and vice versa. И в то же время в Дагестане, особенно в Хасаюрте, в городе, проживает очень много чеченцев целыми населенными пунктами. And in Dagestan, which is the province to the east of Chechnya, in the town of Kasayurt, there is quite a Chechen colony, or Chechen ethnic group. No, конечно, весь Кавказ сочувствует, но единственное, могут сочувствовать, больше ничем они не могут сочувствовать. The Caucasian republics uh, are sympathetic in the sense that they feel sorry for the Chechens, but that's all they are. They don't give help. In the back? The question referred to the recent election on October 5 in Chechnya and the recent election in Azerbaijan on October 15. Uh, I think our speaker indicated that both of these elections were a sham and that President Bush decided uh, basically to overlook uh, those two elections. And I think, Hassan, you're being asked for your comment. 
насчет выборов. выборов. Выборы те, которые прошли в Чечне, в принципе, люди уже заранее знали, что будет президентом Кадыров. Well, with regard to the elections in Chechnya, people knew in advance that uh, Ahmed Kadyrov would be the new president before the elections took place. Потому что всех uh, претендентов, там, Малик Сайдулаев, Аслаханов и другие, их всех отстранили. Because the major opponents like Aslakhanov and Sayyidulayev were basically forced out of the race before the elections took place. И, в принципе, я разговаривал с журналистами, которые побывали в Чечне, особенно вот эта Анна Нева. I've spoken with journalists who were actually in Chechnya, and most specifically with Anne Niva, the French correspondent. Она переоделась чеченкой, взяла паспорт, пошла и против Кадирова проголосовала. She uh, disguised herself as a Chechen woman, went to a polling place, and was allowed to vote, and voted against Kadyrov. И на избирательных участках не было вообще никого. Uh, there were nobody at the polling stations. И uh, проголосовали uh, <coughs> солдаты, которые находятся на территории Чечни. Uh, those who voted were the soldiers who were de de deployed on the territory of Chechnya, the ну, Russian soldiers. В то же время, сами же на месте запол, запол, заполняли бланки и бросали, и голосовали. And um, the voting slips were actually filled out. And here I need to add something to what Hassan said, because he didn't say it, but they were filled out by members of the electoral commissions at the polling offices and stuffed into the ballot box. And incidentally, that information comes from Anne Niva, who witnessed it. Это не выборы, это просто фарс. These were not elections. This was a farce. How did uh, the doctor escape from Chechnya, and how did he manage to get his family to the United States? Ты понял, как ты выбрался до нашей берегу? Ну, в 2000 году меня вывез организация Human Rights Watch. In the year uh, 2000, Human Rights Watch invited me. Uh, и uh, Physician for Human Rights. As well as the Physicians for Human Rights. И, ну, и в то же время участвовали Amnesty International. Amnesty International also played a role in getting me here. Но меня вывезли сюда... Uh, Uh, I came essentially for rehabilitation after what I'd been through. And in Washington, D.C., I went through six months of rehabilitation. And then I learned that it was not desirable for me to go back. Я остался в Америке. So I stayed here. А насчет семьи? Ну, семью я вывез через девять uh, месяцев. Well, I was able to get my family out uh, after about nine months. Yes. эти ужасные условия, они их все-таки стали нормальными, в конце концов, для тех, для тех которые там проживали. Нет, они лучше не стали. Сегодня в Чечне вообще доктора работают в очень тяжелых условиях. Well, conditions haven't gotten any better, uh, and today the doctors in Chechnya are still working in extremely difficult conditions. Потому что нет света. There's no light. 
воды приходится таскать им до самого пятого, шестого этажа с улицы. You have to carry water right up to the fifth, sixth floor of your house. И во время операции часто выключают свет. And uh, during операции, какие операции? Ну, когда после... Нет, когда... Oh, oh, and in the course of uh, surgical operations, electricity is sometimes turned off. И в Грозном они восстановили две-три больницы. Two or three hospitals have been re-established in Grozny. И в этих больницах работают доктора. And uh, doctors work there. <coughs> Просто я знаю, что в принципе наши доктора, они очень приспосабливается любым тяжелым ситуациям. Kind of Лишь бы не бомбили. Just so long as they are not being bombed. Обычные люди, граждане, как они приспосабливаются.